All right. This is going to be chapter one of the network state. I'm going to read through it. Audio book, because there is no audio book. We are creating an audio book. So, so, and if you are on YouTube or um, anywhere else on Rumble, enjoy. I will have it on the screen. So let's begin. Here we go. Chapter one, preamble. Are you the kind of person who skims the beginning just to see whether to read the entire thing? You're in luck. We've prepared one sentence, one image, 1,000 word, and one essay summary concepts behind startup societies and network states. Just click those links if you're impatient. And of course, for the full experience, you can listen to this audiobook one chapter at a time. Speaking of pages, every section of this audio is online and shareable as an individual web page. For example, the URL to this section is thenetworkstate.com forward slash preamble. This allows you to link directly to any bit of the audiobook for discussion. Moreover, unlike the typical audiobook that's frozen in time, think of this as a dynamic audiobook that gets continuously updated. You can see the latest version online, or you can follow the instructions at the networkstate.com forward slash Kindle dot G I F to get the latest version on your Kindle or download the podcast, the Jonathan Kogan show, wherever you get your podcasts and we will update the episodes when reading it or listening. Think of this work as a toolbox, not as a manifesto. You don't need to agree with all of it to get something out of it. We've structured it in a modular form for that reason. Chapter one is an overview of the ideas. Chapters two, three, and four present an analysis that lead to a concerning forecast for the near future, the problem of American anarchy and Chinese control. And chapter five prevents, or presents our proposed solution for maintaining liberal values in an illiberal world, startup societies, and network states. If you're, partis if you're a partisan of the U.S. establishment or the CCP, you may not agree with our problem statement at all. If you are an orthodox Bitcoin maximalist, you likely won't agree with every aspect of our proposed solution. And if you're coming in from another school of thought, you may only agree with parts of the problem or solution as we frame them. Nevertheless, we believe there's enough flexibility in the idea of the network state that you can customize it and make it your own. But what exactly is a network state? The network state in one sentence. In one informal sentence, a network state is a highly aligned online community with a capacity for collective action that crowdfunds territory around the world and eventually gains diplomatic recognition pre existing states. When we think of a nation state, we imagine plans, but when we think of a network state, we should instantly think of the minds. That is, if the nation state system starts with the map of the globe, assigns each patch of land to a single state, the network state system starts with the seven plus billion humans of the world and attracts each mind to one or more networks. Here's a more complex definition that extends the concept and preemptively covers many edge cases. A network state, a social network with a moral innovation, a sense of national consciousness, a recognized founder, a capacity for collective action, an in-person level of civility, an integrated cryptocurrency, a consensual government limited by a social smart contract, an archipelago of crowdfunded physical territories, a virtual capital, and an chain census that provides a large enough population, income, and real estate footprint to attain a measure of diplomatic recognition. Okay, that's a mouthful. It's lengthy because there are more, many internet phenomena that share some, but not all, of the properties of a network state. For example, neither Bitcoin nor Facebook nor a DAO is a network state because each lacks certain qualities, like diplomatic recognition, which are core to anything we think of as the next version of the nation state. If you want to skip ahead, we expand on each part of the definition in Chapter 5. Make more sense if you listen to this audiobook all the way through. For what it's worth, the technical definition of a nation state 
is similarly multi-clausal because it needs to exclude things we don't typically think about, like stateless nations. The network state in one image. A picture helps. The dashboard above, which you can find on networkstate.com, shows what a million-person network state looks like on the map. Specifically, it depicts a network state with 1.7 million people, more than $157 billion in annual income, and 136 million square meter footprint. The first thing we notice is that a network state is physically centralized like a nation state, nor limited in scale like a state. It's geographically decentralized and connected by the internet. The second thing we see is that you could feasibly start this kind of country from your computer. That is, just as Facebook grew from one person's laptop, a million-person network state that owns a global, fit, global area of physical territory could start as a one-person startup society, as shown at the networkstate.com forward slash networkstate.gif. The third thing we see is how central the real-time census is to the network state. The dashboard shown combines concepts from coins, companies, and countries to focus the society on growth in people, income, and real estate footprint. Continued growth is a continuous plebiscite, a vote of confidence by the people inside who remain and those outside who apply. Roughly speaking, a successful network state is one that attracts aligned immigrants and an unsuccessful network state is one that loses them. That doesn't mean each network state must grow to infinity or that all states need accept the same kind of person, but that the community of network states as a whole is focused on building admirable societies that people want to join. Different states will focus on different metrics. Imagine a network state premised on improving its citizens' overall life expectancy, or one aimed at provably right-shipping the income distribution for all. You get what you measure. The network state in 1,000 words. Technology has allowed us to start new companies, new communities, and new currencies. But can we use it to create new cities or even new countries? A key concept is to go cloud first, land last, but not land never, by starting with an online community and then materializing it into the physical world. We get there in seven steps. Step one, found a startup society. This is simply an online community with aspirations of something greater. Anyone can found one, just like anyone can found a company or cryptocurrency. And the founder's legitimacy comes from whether people opt to follow them. Step two, organize it into a group of capable of collective action. Given a su sufficiently dedicated online community, the next step is to organize it into a network union. Unlike a social network, a network union has a purpose. It coordinates its members for their mutual benefit. And unlike a traditional union, a network union is not set up solely in opposition to a particular corporation, so it can take a variety of different collective actions. Unionization is a key step because it turns an otherwise ineffective online community into a group of people working together for a common cause. Step three, build trust offline and a crypto economy online. Begin holding in-person meetups in the physical world of increasing scale and duration while simultaneously building an internal economy using cryptocurrency. Step four, crowdfund physical nodes. Once sufficient trust has been built and funds have been accumulated, start crowdfunding apartments, houses, and even towns to bring digital citizens into the physical world within real co-living communities. Step five, digitally connect physical communities. Let these physical nodes together into a network archipelago, a set of digitally connected physical territories distributed around the world. Nodes of the network physical territory range from one-person apartments to in-person communities of arbitrary size. Physical access is granted by holding a Web3 crypto passport, and mixed reality is used to seamlessly link the online and offline worlds. Step six. Conduct an on-chain census. As the society scales, run a cryptographically all census to demonstrate the growing size of your population, income, and real estate footprint. 
This is how a startup society proves traction in the face of skepticism. Step seven, gain diplomatic recognition. A startup society with sufficient scale should eventually be able to negotiate for diplomatic recognition from at least one pre-existing government. And from there, gradually increase sovereignty, slowly becoming a true network state. The key idea is to populate the land from the cloud and do so all over the earth. Unlike an ideologically disaligned and geographically centralized legacy state, which packs millions of people in one place, a network state is ideologically aligned but geographically decentralized. The people are spread around the world in clusters of varying size, but their hearts are in one place. As the population and economy of a startup society grow comparable to that of a legacy state with millions of citizens and billions in income, it should eventually be able to attain recognition from existing sovereigns and ultimately the United Nations, just as Bitcoin has now been a bona fide national currency. The network state in one essay. A proposition is not a nation, but can become one. Here we describe a peaceful, reproducible process for turning an online community premised on a proposition into a physical state with a virtual capital, a network state, the sequel to the nation state. We want to be able to peacefully, peacefully start a new state for the same reason we want a bare plot of earth, a blank sheet of paper, an empty text buffer, a fresh startup, or a clean slate, because we want to build something new without historical constraint. The financial demand for a clean slate is clear. People buy millions of acres of vacant land and incorporate hundreds of thousands of new companies each year, spending billions just to get that fresh start. And now that it is possible to start not just new companies, but new communities and even new currencies, we see people flocking to create those as well. The societal value of a clean slate is also clear. In the, technolo in the technology sector alone, the ability to form new companies has created trillions of dollars in wealth over the past few decades. Indeed, if we imagine a world where you couldn't just obtain a blank sheet of paper, but had to erase an older one, where you, wouldn't, where you couldn't just acquire bare land, but had to knock down a standing building, where you couldn't just create a new company, but had an existing firm, we imagine endless conflict over scarce resources. Perhaps we don't have to think too hard to imagine this world. It resembles in the distant past, people could only write on clay tablets. In the recent past, they were executed for contemplating entrepreneurship, and in the immediate present, they are arguing over replacing an ancient gas station. In these times and places, making a fresh start has been technologically infeasible, politically impossible, or judicially punishable. And that's where we are today with countries, cities, nations, governments, institutions, and much of the physical world. Because the brand new is unthinkable, we, but perhaps we can change that. How to start a new country. There are at least six ways to start a new country. Three are conventional and three are unconventional. We will introduce them only to deprioritize them all in favor of a seven. One, election. The most conventional way to start a new country involves winning sufficient power in an election to either A, rewrite the laws of an existing state, or B, carve out a new one from scratch with the recognition of the international community. This is the most widely discussed path and by far the most crowded, perhaps crowded. Two, revolution. The second obvious way is a political revolution. We don't advise attempting this. Particularly momentous elections are sometimes referred to as revolutions, though a revolution frequently involves bloodshed. Revolutions are infrequent, but everyone knows that they mean a new government. Three, war. The third conventional way to form a new state is to win a war. We don't advise attempting this either. A war is, of course, not independent from the other two. Indeed, both elections and revolutions can lead to wars that end up carving out new policies. Like a revolution, a war is infrequent and undesirable, but is a means by which to redraw state borders. Micronations. Now we get to the un unconventional. The most obvious of the unconventional approaches 
and the one most people think of when they hear the concept of starting a new country occurs when an eccentric plants a flag on an offshore platform or disputed patch of dirt and declares themselves king of nothing. If the issue with elections is that too many people care about them, the issue with these so-called micronations is that too few people care. Because a state, like a currency, is an inherently social affair, a few people in the middle of nowhere won't be able to organize a military, enforce laws, or be recognized by other countries. Moreover, while an existing state may be content to let people harmlessly LARP a fake country in their own backyard, an actual threat to sovereignty typically produces a response with real guns, whether that be the Falklands or Sakhalin. 5. Seasteading Here is where things start to get interesting. Conceived by Patrick Friedman and backed by Peter Thiel, seasteading essentially starts with the observation that cruise ships exist and asks whether we could move from a few weeks on the water at a time to semi-permanent habitation in international waters, with frequent docking, of course. If the cost of cruise ships falls, this approach becomes more feasible. But while there are individuals who live on cruise ships year-round, we haven't yet seen a scaled example. Six, space. Perhaps the most prestigious of the start a new country paths is the idea of colonizing other planets. Unlike seasteading or micronations, space exploration started at the government level and has been glamorized in many movies and TV shows, so it enjoys a higher degree of social acceptability. This path is typically received as temporarily technically infeasible, rather than outright crazy. Elon Musk's SpaceX is one entity seriously contemplating the logistics of starting a new state on Mars. 7. Network States And finally, we arrived at our preferred method, the network state. Our idea is to proceed cloud first, land last. Rather than starting with the physical territory, we start with the digital community. We create a startup society, organize into a network union, crowdfund the physical nodes of a network, and in the fullness of time, eventually negotiate for diplomatic recognition to become a true network state. We build the embryonic state as an open source project. We organize our internal economy around remote work. We cultivate in-person levels of civility. We simulate architecture in VR, and we create art and literature that reflects our values. When we crowdfund territory in, real, in the real world, it's not necessarily contiguous territory because an underappreciated fact is that the internet allows us to network enclaves. Put in another way, a network need not require all its territory in one place at one time. It can connect a thousand apartments, a hundred houses, and a dozen cul-de-sacs in different cities into a new kind of fractal polity with its capital in the cloud. Community members migrate between these enclaves or enclaves and crowdfund territory nearby with every individual dwelling and group house presenting an independent opportunity for expansion. And with a thousand such enclaves, rather than four directions to expand, north, east, south, and west, there are more like 4,000. What we've described thus far is much like an ethnic in which immigrants, in which immigrants are inter internationally dis uh, dispersed but connected by communication channels with each other and the motherland. The twist is that our version is a reverse diaspora, a community that forms first on the internet, builds a culture online, and only then comes together in person to build dwellings and structures. In a sense, you can think of each physical outpost of this digital community as a cloud embassy, similar to the grassroots Bitcoin embassies that have arisen around the world to help people better understand Bitcoin. New recruits can visit either the virtual or physical parts of a network state, beta test it, and decide to leave or stay. Now, with all this talk of embassies and countries, one might well contend that network states, like the aforementioned micronations, are just a LARP. Unlike micronations, however, they are set up to be scaled LARP, a feat of imagination practiced by large numbers of people at the same time. And the experience of cryptocurrencies over the last decade shows us just how powerful such a shared LARP can be.
Minimum Necessary Innovation. Let's pause and summarize for a second. The main difference between the seventh method, network states, and the previous six, election, revolution, war, micronations, seasteading, and space, is that the seventh straddles the boundary between practicality and impracticality. It is now feasible to build a million person online communities, start billion dollar digital currencies, and architect buildings in virtual reality to then crowdfund into reality. The network state concept stacks together many existing technologies rather than requiring the invention of new ones like Mars capable rockets or permanent habitation seasteads. At the same time, it avoids the obvious pathways of election, revolution, and war, all of which turn ugly and none of which provide much venue for individual initiative. In other words, the network state takes the most robust existing tech stack we have, namely the suite of technologies built around the internet, and uses it to route around political roadblocks without waiting for future physical innovation. What counts as a new country? Having outlined these seven methods, the careful reader will notice that we have played a bit fast and loose with the definition of what a new country is. First, what do we mean by a new country? One definition is that starting a new country means settling wholly new territory like colonizing Mars. Another definition is that simply changing the form of government actually changes the country, like France moving from the Second French Republic to the Second French Empire. Rather than using either of these strict or loose definitions, we will use both numerical and societal definitions of a new country. The numerical definition begins with visualizing a hypothetical nation real estate pop.com site similar to coinmarketcap.com, which aggregates the cryptographically audited census of starved societies aspiring to become network states. This dashboard would show in real time the number of community members, the acreage of real estate owned by these members, and the community's on-chain income. A starved society with 5 million people worldwide thousands of square miles of discontinuous community-owned land, and billions in annual income would have indisputable numerical significance. This, in turn, leads us to the societal definition. A new country is one that is diplomatically recognized by other countries as a legitimate polity capable of self-determination. A state with enough such bilateral relationships would have the societal significance to gain a group of pre-existing states like ASEAN, the OAS, the African Union, the EU, or the United Nations. This combination of numerical and societal metrics matches the emergence of cryptocurrency. Initially ignored, then mocked as an obvious failure, within five years after its invention, Bitcoin attained a billion-dollar market capitalization, a numerical success and was subsequently listed on CNBC and Bloomberg alongside blue chip stocks, a form of societal recognition. Sending numerically on its own with greater societal recognition following in its wake. By 2020, it had changed the trajectory of the People's Bank of China, the IMF, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, and the World Bank. 2021, Bitcoin became legal tender in El Salvador, a sovereign state. And by mid-2022, the Central African Republic had followed with dozens more considering Bitcoin as legal tender, including Panama. Most countries are small countries. Cryptocurrency could achieve these heights because money has both numerical and societal aspects. The numbers could be piled up before the societal accolades followed. Once Bitcoin had proven that it couldn't be easily counterfeited or hacked, the shared belief of millions of cryptocurrency holders worldwide was enough to get BTC from a value of zero to a market cap of billions, and from there to a listing on every Bloomberg terminal and exchange. Societal traction of this kind paved the way for more numerical traction, and a virtuous cycle followed. Could a startup society follow a similar path? Yes. A cryptographically auditable census could prove that a growing startup society had 1 to 10 million committed digital citizens, large cryptocurrency reserves, years of continuous existence, and physical holdings all over the earth. 
That numerical traction could then be used to achieve the societal traction of diplomatic recognition. Why? Because most countries are small countries. A new state with a population of 1 to 10 million would actually be comparable to most existing states. That's because of the 193 UN-recognized sovereign states, 20% have a population of less than 1 million, and 55% have a population of less than 10 million. This includes many countries typically thought such as Luxembourg, 615,000, Cyprus, 1.2 million, Estonia, 1.3 million, New Zealand, 4.7 million, Ireland, 4.8 million, and Singapore, 5.8 million. These user counts are su surprisingly small by tech standards. Of course, mere quantity is not everything. The strength of affiliation to our hypothetical network state matters, as does the time on the property, the percentage of net worth stored in the currency, and the fraction of contacts found in the community. Still, once we remember that Facebook had 3 billion users, Twitter has 300 million, and many individual influencers had over a million followers, it starts to be not too crazy to imagine we can build a 1 to 10 million person startup society with a genuine sense of national consciousness, an integrated cryptocurrency, and a plan to crowdfund many pieces of territory around the world. With the internet, we can digitally sew these disjoint enclaves together into a new kind of polity that achieves diplomatic recognition, a network state. Your next part will be chapter two, which will be the next episode of 